Hi guys, uh, so today we are going to look at graphing rational functions. So we introduced them briefly uh, last class when we looked at inverse variation. That was kind of a practical example there. So we're going to look today at actually drawing the graphs for rational functions. Now at the beginning of the year you saw the rational parent function. The rational parent function was 1 over x. Uh, but a rational function is actually anything where you have one polynomial divided by another polynomial. Um, that's what this is telling us here. So as long as those two functions are polynomials, then my graph is a rational function. So the rational parent function, we looked at that graph in class a little bit. Um, it looks something like this. And what was different about this graph is it had something called asymptotes. Um, there was a vertical asymptote and there was a horizontal asymptote. And we're going to talk about those a lot today. So what an asymptote is, it's basically what your graph is getting very, very, very close to without really actually touching. So for example, here, this graph, it keeps getting up, 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 and keeps going higher and higher and higher, but it doesn't actually touch um, that value. And if you think about it, it makes sense. That's an x value of 0. If I plug that into my equation, I'd have 1 divided by 0. That can't happen. Okay, I can get very, very, very close to it, but I can't actually ever divide by zero, which is why I'm just going to get as close to that line as I possibly can without actually touching it. Then when y equals zero, um, that's going to be my horizontal asymptote. So again, this graph is going to get closer and closer and closer, but it's actually not going to touch that value. Now, it is possible to cross a horizontal asymptote, which you'll see here later on, but uh, typically what a horizontal asymptote does is it just shows your end behavior. So it shows what your graph is going towards. So it is possible to cross a horizontal asymptote. It is not possible to cross a vertical asymptote, because again, vertical asymptotes, you can't divide by zero, and that's where they're going to occur. So let's talk about the domain and range of this function. So domain are the x values. So left to right, this graph to the left keeps on going all the way to negative infinity. Then it gets as close to zero as I possibly can, but it doesn't actually touch zero, so we put a parenthesis, not the hard bracket. Then it picks back up as close to zero as I can possibly get, and then it keeps on going for forever until infinity. My range is going to look very similar. Bottom to top, there is nothing on the bottom. It keeps on going for forever. Okay, again, that's this part right here. Then as I get close to zero, it doesn't actually touch it. It comes close to it. And then it picks back up and it continues to infinity. Range will be a little bit harder for these because your horizontal asymptote is not necessarily going to affect your range, but it may. Uh, it's really good to, in order to figure out your range to draw the graph so you can see what it's doing. The other thing you can do is if you wanted to, you could solve algebraically. Range is y values. If I want to know if this crossed the horizontal asymptote, if I set it equal, okay, that's something that can never happen. Okay, I'm never going to end up getting a value of zero. So I know this graph is never going to cross that asymptote. But again, we'll see some more examples of that here in a minute. Okay, those, the asymptotes, we're always going to, they're lines. We need to keep that in mind. So we need to write them as the equation of a line. So remember, horizontal lines are y equals lines. Vertical lines are x equals lines. So there is a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. There is a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. And then finally, we have our end behavior. So end behavior is a little bit different than we're used to seeing. We're still going to write it the same way, though. So as x approaches infinity, my y's are getting closer and closer and closer to the same y value, which is 0. And then as x approaches negative infinity, my y's are getting closer and closer and closer again to 0. It doesn't matter that which side of the line it's on. It just matters, again, what y value it's getting close to. So both of those are actually approaching 0. And for rational functions, horizontal asymptote is going to be the key to finding your end behavior. Uh, vertical asymptotes is going to be very helpful for your domain. And there's one other thing that will affect your domain, which we will talk about here in a minute. 
All right, so let's talk about transformations, okay? So sometimes, instead of looking at a whole rational function, we may just transform the parent function. This is going to work very similar to what we did with all of our other parent function transformations, all right? A is our vertical stretch, okay? So that's going to stretch our graph. And if you remember, we did that activity in class with the Desmos, so you could actually see what that A value did. But the important thing to keep in mind is that if A is negative, then it's a reflection, which means your little hyperbola curves would be going in that direction. H is a horizontal shift. And again, remember, in the equation, it's minus. So if it's x minus 3, we'd be going to the right 3. If it was x plus 3, we'd be going to the left 3. And then k is going to be my vertical shift. And this one works just like normal, okay? If it's plus a number, it's going up. If it's minus a number, it's going to go down. So let's look at this equation here. We're going to find the asymptotes, the domain, and the range. Um, so to start, I'm actually going to draw a graph. So I'm going to take the asymptotes of the parent function, and I'm going to transform them. So the transformations that I have here, if it's x plus 2, I'm going to go to the left. Two. So that is going to move my vertical asymptote to negative 2. Then this graph has been shifted down 7. Alright, that's what the minus 7 does. So vertical shift down 7, horizontal shift left 2. So that means that my horizontal asymptote is going to be all the way down here. So now I just need to draw my little curves. All right, I'm going to have one curve to the left of the asymptote, one curve to the right of the asymptote. I'm never going to have two curves like this because that wouldn't be a function. So again, um, think about the parent function. This has not been reflected, so it's going to look like my parent function. And we're going to talk more specifics um, to get this a little bit of a better picture. We're going to talk about our intercepts later. For now, um, we'll just really focus on finding where those asymptotes are. So now I'm going to write my domain. All right, left to right, negative infinity, and then I get to the asymptote at negative 2. And I stop and I pick back up. So these are all parentheses here, because again, we don't actually touch the asymptote. Then I'm going to look at my range, bottom to top. And then I'm just going to write the equations of my asymptotes. My vertical asymptote is an x equals line, so it is x equals negative 2 horizontal asymptote is a y equals line. So this is just a very basic rational function based off your transformations. Now what we're going to see are some more complicated rational functions, which is why we need to know more than just our transformations. All right, so let's talk about uh, finding asymptotes and intercepts for any function. Always when it comes to rational functions, it is extremely important that you factor first. Okay, you have to factor first um, because there's going to be these things called holes which could occur in our graph, and if we don't factor, we may miss that. So be very careful. Always factor first. So if you've been struggling with factoring, make sure you come in and get some help. So let's start with vertical asymptotes. We already talked about this a little bit. Vertical asymptotes restrict the domain. They occur whenever you are dividing by zero because, again, that can't happen, and you'll get closer and closer and closer to that value, but you can't actually do it. So to find vertical asymptotes, we set the bottom of the fraction, which is the denominator, equal to zero. There can be more than one, um, but it doesn't really, it just kind of depends on the function that you have. All right, x-intercepts. X-intercepts occur, remember that another word for those was zeros, because it's when the entire function equals zero. So if I want my function to equal zero, well, zero divided by anything is equal to zero. 
So it doesn't matter what's on the bottom of my function. If the top equals zero, the whole thing equals zero. So to find my x-intercepts, I set the numerator or the top equal to zero. Again, another reason it's helpful to factor is if you factored, it's really easy to set these values equal to zero. Y-intercept, you will always find this the same way for every function we ever do. To find the y-intercept, you plug in zero for x. Anywhere there's an x. And this is a little bit easier if you use the original um, as opposed to using the factored form. But you can do either way, you'll still get the same answer. Horizontal asymptotes is probably the hardest one to remember, but the easiest one to find. So there's three different cases. In order to figure out the horizontal asymptote, we have to consider the degree of the top of our fraction and the degree of the bottom of our fraction. And if you remember, degree is what we talked about in the last unit with polynomials. The degree is basically the biggest exponent. So if the degree is higher in the denominator, okay, if the denominator is a higher degree, then we say it's bottom heavy. If it is bottom heavy, our horizontal asymptote is just y equals zero. If they are an equal degree, okay, then we divide the leading coefficients We'll see an example of this here in a second. Then finally, if it's top heavy, where the degree in the numerator is higher, then there is no horizontal asymptote. But we'll see this here in a second. If it's exactly one degree higher, then there's going to be a slant asymptote. Okay, a slant asymptote. So let's just look at an example for finding horizontal asymptotes. Again, we look at the degree. In this case, it's written out in standard form, so I just look at my exponents. The top is degree four, the bottom is degree four. They're the same degree. So I divide the leading coefficients which is eight and two, and eight divided by two gives me four. All right, in this case, um, I have to think if this were multiplied out, this would be x squared, so this is a second degree. If this were multiplied out, it'd be x cubed, so this is third degree, so this one is bottom heavy. If it's bottom heavy, my horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. Now, all of these things are really good uh, indicators to help us draw our graph. So what we're going to do before we draw our graph is we're actually going to find our asymptotes and our intercepts. So let's start with this first example. Let's start with our asymptotes. Vertical asymptote, set the bottom equal to 0. So I get x equals 1. So that's my vertical asymptote. All right, horizontal asymptote, this is same degree. They are ver both first degree polynomials. Divide the leading coefficients, which is 2 divided by 1. All right, then we'll look at our intercepts. X-intercepts, the zeros, I set the top equal to 0. Because again, 0 divided by anything gives us 0, and an x-intercept is a 0. So 3 over 2, comma, 0. 1 and a half, comma, 0. And then my y-intercept, I'm going to plug in 0 everywhere there's an x. So 0 minus 3 divided by 0 minus 1. So 0, 3 is my y-intercept. And again, this gives us a very good clue of what our graph is going to look like. Uh, if you remember when we did that activity in class, we said if it's going um, at that, if that vertical asymptote, if that factor is not squared, we're going to be going in opposite directions. So one of them is going up and one of them is going down. Again, we have to touch our intercepts. So I need one of my curves to be there. My other curve needs to be here. 
If you're not sure where those lines should go or if your intercepts don't give you enough information, another thing you can do is always plug in a test point. So if I wasn't sure, I could plug in four and I could see what I get. All right, so again, if you're never sure what your graph's gonna look like, plug in points. It's a really quick, easy way to figure out what your graph's gonna look like. All right, now let's look at B. Again, I always need to factor first. So I'm gonna go ahead and rewrite this as x plus three x minus 3. And now we'll find our vertical asymptotes. I set the bottom equal to 0, so there's going to be 2 this time. And you can have more than one vertical asymptote. You can have a lot more than one. It just depends on what your denominator is going to equal. Horizontal asymptote. This one is bottom heavy. If it's bottom heavy, then it's y equals 0. All right, intercepts. X-intercept is when the top is equal to zero. So that's my X-intercept. So if you notice, that's a little weird, right? That's on our graph. Um, that's gonna give us kind of a big clue in what this graph is gonna look like. And then our Y-intercept. Plug in zero, again, I'm gonna plug in zero to the original just cause it's a little bit easier and I get 1 over 9. This is another good clue in what my graph is going to look like. All right, now, keep in mind, the only time your graph can switch between positive and negative is at a vertical asymptote or at an x-intercept. So I know this graph has to go up at this asymptote. If I'm up on that side, I need to be down at the other because nothing's squared. And then, again, we talked about the last unit with our polynomial functions. Okay, this factor was not squared, which means it's not going to touch, so it's not going to bounce back up. Because again, in order for it to be tangent like that, that factor would need to be squared. It's not, so we continue down. And then if it's down on that end, it needs to be up on the other end. Because again, there are no squared factors. There's no tangency, no togetherness on this graph. Again, if we weren't sure what this graph was doing, if you kind of forget some of those rules, pick a point, plug it in. What's really nice about these graphs it doesn't matter where or the exact value of it. We just need to know, is my graph positive or negative at that point? So let's say I didn't know what this far right graph uh, was going to look like. Let's pick some random point, like 5. If I plugged in 5, 5 minus 1 would be a positive number. 5 plus 3 is a positive number, and 5 minus 3 is a positive number. Well, if I have a positive divided by a positive times a positive, all of those y values are going to be positive. So I know I've drawn my graph in the correct place. And again, you can't switch between positive and negative unless it's at an x-intercept or it's at a vertical asymptote. So everything to the right of that asymptote is going to be positive, which it is. So that's another way you can find those points. So now let's look at some harder graphs. This wasn't enough already for you guys. A slant asymptote. We talked about this very briefly at the very beginning. So a slant asymptote occurs when the degree on the top is higher than the degree on the bottom by exactly 1. Okay, so a slant asymptote takes the place of a horizontal asymptote. You will not have both. It is a one or the other. All right, so a slant asymptote, again, it takes the place of a horizontal asymptote. It still shows us end behavior, but our end behavior is going to look a little bit different. To find a slant asymptote, we use division. If it's just uh, x plus or minus a number, a first degree, that you're dividing by, go ahead and use synthetic division. But if it's higher than first degree, then you'll have to use long division. But we're going to divide, and what's a little bit easier here at least, we can ignore the remainder. So let's go ahead and look at this first example. Again, we always need to factor first. So to start, I'm going to factor. Nothing cancels out, so that's good. So I'm going to start by listing my vertical asymptote. Very easy. Now to find my horizontal asymptote. We know there's none. But the top is one degree higher than the bottom, so there is going to be a slant asymptote. To find that, I'm going to use division. In this case, I'm going to do synthetic division. 
And again, if that was dividing by a second degree, then I'd have to use long division. But in this case, I am just going to use synthetic. The remainder doesn't matter. I start one degree higher than my original, so this is x plus 1. So my slant asymptote equation is y equals x plus 1. So all I have to do is graph the line y equals x plus 1. That's a slope of 1 with a y-intercept of 1. So there is my asymptote. All right, I'm going to go ahead and plot my vertical asymptote. And if you look at it, it looks just like basically your regular equation would, except it's turned. There's still a section here and a section here. It's going to be one of those two. There's still a section here and a section here. All right, and then uh, let's just finish up. We're going to go ahead and do our intercepts. X-intercept. Set the top equal to 0. There's going to be 2 this time. So 3, 0 and negative 2, 0 are both intercepts. And that gives us a pretty good clue on what our graph's going to look like. Y-intercept, plug in 0 to x, and again, I'm going to do that to the original. Negative 6 divided by negative 2 is 3. And again, it's pretty clear where these curves are going to go just based on where those or based on where those intercepts are. I go toward that asymptote, toward that asymptote. I can't have anything in this section because then it wouldn't be a function. All right, I have to touch my intercept, and then I can't have anything in this section because again, it wouldn't be a function. So there is my graph. And then real quick, let's just do our domain and range here. So my domain, everything except for the vertical asymptote. My range in this case though, nothing stopping it. My range is actually negative infinity to infinity. Every y value is possible here. And then my end behavior, a little different this time because there is no horizontal asymptote. As x approaches infinity, y approaches infinity. It keeps on getting bigger. As x approaches negative infinity, y is approaching negative infinity. So the end behavior matches the line y equals x plus 1, which is a very similar end behavior to what you saw in the last unit. All right, the last thing we're going to look at, uh, sorry this is a little bit longer, but the good thing is you guys will get an extra work day to spend some time with these. The reason we always have to factor first is because of these removable discontinuities, which is a fancy way of saying that there is a hole in your graph. All right. So if a factor cancels out, it doesn't just disappear. It actually creates a hole in your graph. Uh, what that looks like basically is your graph is going to hit that open circle and then it's going to keep going. We call it a removable discontinuity because your graph isn't continuous. But if I just filled in the hole, my graph would be continuous. That's why it's removable. All right, now to find a hole, let's go ahead. There's a lot of words here to describe it, but I want to go ahead and actually do the example here. Again, always factor first, because if you don't factor first, you may think, hey, this is top heavy. Let me do synthetic division to find a slant asymptote. But let me go ahead and factor, and you'll notice something that happens. That x minus 3 factor cancels out. All right, so if a factor cancels out, it creates a hole. The x coordinate of the hole is the zero of the canceled factor. So if I canceled out x minus 3, positive 3 is where the hole is. Okay, but again, the hole is just a coordinate, so it has to have a y coordinate. To get the y coordinate, I plug 3 into the remaining function. So it's really important to look at what's left over. Okay, because what I have left over is what I'm going to use to answer the rest of the question. What I have left here is just a line. Okay, so let me plug 3 in. 3 plus 3 gives me 6. So I'm going to have an open circle at 3, 6. Which is going to be a little bit off my graph. Sorry about that. For the rest of this question, I'm going to graph y equals x plus 3. 
it's actually not even a rational function. Okay, y equals x plus 3 is just the line y equals x plus 3. So I'm going to graph that line. And that's what my graph looks like. It's just a straight line with an open circle in it. All right, again, this is why it's always important for us to, uh, to factor first to make sure we don't miss any holes. All right, let's look at the next example. Factor the bottom. x minus 5 cancels out. All right, so the remaining function then, be careful here. x minus 5 cancels out. I'm left with 1 over x plus 2. I'm not just left with x plus 2. All right, just because it cancels out, it doesn't disappear. We're dividing it out. So when you divide it out, you're still left with that 1. So now this is my remaining function. So this graph has a hole. The x coordinate of the hole is going to be 5 because I canceled out x minus 5. All right. Um, to get the y coordinate, I plug 5 into x in the remaining function. So the y coordinate of the hole is 1 over 7. So there's my hole. So now what I'm left with, rational function, I'm going to graph this the same way we just did all of our other examples. Vertical asymptote at negative 2. Horizontal asymptote, it is bottom heavy, so it's y equals 0. X-intercept, when the top equals 0, is 1 ever going to equal 0? Okay, no, so there is none. This graph will not have an x-intercept. Y-intercept, I plug in 0 for x, again, into the remaining function, which gives me 1 half. So let's plot those things real quick. All right, there's my y-intercept. And again, I have to go through my y-intercept. I go towards my hole, and there's the first part of my graph. There's nothing tangent. There's the second part of my graph. Get it, if you weren't sure about this left side, pick a test point, okay? If I plug in negative six, okay? I have one divided by negative six plus two, which is a negative number. Everything to the left of negative 2 is going to be a negative number. All right, there are just two last examples. So if you think you have the hang of it, you can go ahead and stop watching it at this point. If you want to see these last two examples, though, I would try them on your own first and then check your answers because I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. So again, pause the video, try these examples, and then we'll go through it together. All right, so I went ahead and factored. X minus 5 cancels out. I'm left then with a the function x plus 1 over x plus 5. So negative 5 is a vertical asymptote. y equals 1 would be my horizontal asymptote because they're same degree. My x-intercept would be negative 1, 0. My y-intercept would be one-fifth. And then my whole. Okay, I canceled out x minus 5. So positive 5 is the x-coordinate. I plug positive 5 into the remaining function. So there is my whole. And there's the first part of my graph. And there is the next part of my graph. All right, and then last one. Let me go ahead and factor. All right, so this time actually is no hole. I have a vertical asymptote at x equals 1 half. And if you notice, that factor is squared, which means at x equals 1 half, my graph is going to be together. It's going to be going in the same direction. Horizontal asymptote would be y equals 0. This is bottom heavy. All 
All right, then I have my intercepts. My x-intercept would be 2, 0. My y-intercept, plug in 0 wherever there's an x, so I get negative 2. All right, so again, that intercept gives you a good clue in where this graph is going to be. I have to be in the bottom here because of where my intercept is. All right, then this one's going to look a little weird. Again, you can always plug in test points if you're not sure. That factor was squared, so I should be going in the same direction at that point. That factor is not squared, so I am going to cross through it, but I still go towards my asymptote. And that's your graph. Again, if you're not sure, plug in a test point. Okay, let's say I want to see what my graph is doing over here on this side. All right, then I would plug in some negative number, negative 5. Negative 5 minus 2 is a negative number. 2 times negative 5 minus 1 is negative. 2 times negative 5 minus 1 is negative. If I have all of these negatives, then everything to the left of that point is going to be a negative value. All right. Pick something to the right of my x-intercept, like if I plugged in positive 5, 5 minus 2, 2 times 5 minus 1, 2 times 5 minus 1. Okay, all of those are positive, so everything to the right here is positive. So if you're not sure, plug in the test point, figure out if your graph is positive or negative. Alright, I know that is a lot, uh, but you are going to have a whole work day on this tomorrow to get some extra practice with it.